I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Nate, Nate, Nathan Runkle to you. He is the founder and executive director of Mercy for Animals out of now LA. And he's a nationally recognized speaker on animal advocacy, grassroots activism, and factory farming. Mercy for Animals is a nonprofit organization dedicated to preventing cruelty to farm animals and promoting compassionate food choices and policies. It, he, it, this organization, Mercy for Animals, is likely to be the most effective animal rights group in the country, bar none. They do this through undercover investigations, humane education, leafleting, and social media, and many other avenues. Veg News Magazine has recognized Mercy for Animals as Nonprofit of the Year, and Nathan as one of the 25 most fascinating vegetarians and one of the 20 top activists under 30. I'll let everyone know, but Nathan just turned 28 <laughs> two days ago, so it's still his birthday week. And um, I just asked them this question because I wasn't sure, but he did his first open rescue at the age of 17. So he's already a veteran in the animal rights community. So without further ado, let's welcome Nathan Runkle. How's everyone? Thanks for sticking around to see me. I'm the last one. Um, so, as you have heard, my name is Nathan Runkle, and I'm the founder and executive director of Mercy for Animals. Mercy for Animals is based on the belief that non-human animals are irreplaceable individuals with morally significant interests and hence rights, including the right to live free of unnecessary suffering. We work to be a voice for farmed animals in four main ways. One is through education, the other is through cruelty investigations, the third is through corporate outreach, and the fourth is through legal advocacy. So I'm gonna talk about quite a few things today. I'm gonna to talk about who farmed animals are, farmed animals intelligence and emotion. I'm gonna talk about the transition into factory farming and really talk about what that system looks like today. And then I'm going to talk about the solution and what I view as a very optimistic future for pushing for change on this issue. So I became a vegetarian when I was 11 years old and founded Mercy for Animals when I was 15. I grew up on a small farm in rural Ohio and always had a natural affinity and connection to animals. It was my dogs and cats as a child that taught me that all animals had personalities and needs and interests and desires. And in that community, however, I saw a lot of animal abuse. Both of my uncles were hunters and trappers and fishermen, so I saw animals being skinned and scaled alive, having their heads ripped off. And at a young age, that felt wrong to me, even though no one in my family circle or in my community really validated those feelings. A few years uh, later, at a local high school, there was an animal abuse case which involved an agriculture teacher who also owned a pig farm bringing to school a bucket of day-old piglets that he had tried to kill that morning on his farm. When he arrived to the school, one of the piglets was still alive. So a student in the class, who also did part-time work on this pig farm, took the piglet by her hind legs and slammed her headfirst into the ground in an attempt to kill her. Now this piglet was so determined to survive that now her skull fractured, bleeding out of the mouth, bruised, um, was still alive, a few of the students took her out of the classroom to another teacher who was known as being sympathetic to animal abuse and being the vegetarian at this rural school. She left and went to a local veterinarian to have this, this animal who's suffering greatly euthanized. She worked and contacted local law enforcement to have cruelty to animal charges filed against that student and that teacher. It went to court and in this small town in rural Ohio, all of the agriculture industry, the farmers, the pork community rallied behind the student and teacher in support of them, saying we don't want animal rights activists coming into our community to tell us how to do our jobs. The very first day of that trial, all of the cruelty charges were dismissed because it's considered standard agricultural mm -hmm. practice to kill piglets in this way. It's called blunt head trauma or thumping by the industry. And in Ohio, like many other states, if something is considered standard agricultural practice, it's exempt from cruelty prosecution, no matter how cruel it is. So that case illustrated to me that there needed to be a strong voice in this rural area for farmed animals. 
and that no one was really giving them the voice that they deserved. So Mercy for Animals grew out of that. And through my work with MFA, I have personally gone undercover into factory farms. This is a photograph of a hen named Hope who I pulled literally out of a trash can. She was still alive at one of the largest egg farms in Ohio. I've had animals die in my hands. I've seen the darkest side of humanity, the abuse that we are capable of inflicting on animals for profit. But I've also seen the brightest side of humanity, the compassion and empathy and respect that we're very capable of. So I want to start out with a quote from Dr. Jane Goodall. She said, we have to understand that we are not the only beings on this planet with personalities and minds. And as I'm sure most of you know, Dr. Goodall spent over 40 years uh, essentially living with chimps in Africa. And she was really one of the first people to start tearing down the species barrier and showing that attributes and traits that we thought were so unique and special to people were in fact rather common in the animal kingdom. And Dr. Goodall was one of the first people to actually start to give her subjects, these animals, names. This was during a time when even many in the veterinary community was, did not accept that all animals suffered pain and fear and distress. Now what she showed is that primates use tools, they have language, and they actually have culture. They're capable of, of great aggression and violence, but also great empathy and compassion as well. And there's a, a great film that's coming out by Disney Nature uh, a, about a, a chimp, Oscar, who was orphaned, and a male chimp actually takes Oscar under his arms and raises him, um, showing the, the empathy that these animals are very capable of. And Dr. Goodall really set into motion this field of animal behavior that now we have uh, individuals and animal behaviorists like Mark Beckoff and Jonathan Balcom who are showing that this isn't just unique to primates, but whales and dolphins and cows and pigs and chickens all have these very similar abilities. And you don't have to be an animal behaviorist to understand this. We live in a country where half of us share our homes with dogs or cats. Half of those animals will receive Christmas gifts from us because we <laughs> consider them parts of our family. And we consider them parts of our family because we know how special they are. We know that they miss us when we're gone, that they're excited when we get home, that they can be jealous and frustrated. So we know from our personal experiences that animals have these needs. Unfortunately, we still live in a society where animal abuse runs rampant. And if we were to walk outside of the, the confines of this very a supportive event and went out onto the street corners of really any city in America, whether it be a large city or a small city, and we polled people and we said, what do you think about cruelty to animals? Is this something that you accept? 96% or more of Americans would tell you that cruelty to animals is not acceptable and that they believe animals deserve protection from harm. National studies have been done on this issue by Zogby and Gallup that show this. I challenge you to find 96% of Americans that agree on anything else. This is an issue that really transcends all backgrounds, races, ages, political beliefs. However, we still live in a society where billions, literally billions of animals are subjected to cruelty that is so egregious that few of us even want to bear witness to it. When we think of animal abuse, though, in this country, we think of dogs and cats. We think of animals that are used for dog fighting. We think of people beating their dog or cat or leaving them out in the cold. And these are certainly important issues. But really, when we talk about animal cruelty, we should be thinking about farmed animals. 99 out of every 100 animals that we use and abuse and exploit and kill in this country is a farmed animal. Yet, these are the animals that very few of us give much thought or consideration to. And they're killed at an alarming rate. As you see on this chart, nearly 300 farmed animals are killed every single second in this country. That's almost 9 billion a year. Most of them are chickens. Over 280 chickens killed every single second. So as the saying goes, one death is a tragedy. It's easy for us to relate to one death. But a million deaths, or in this case 9 billion, is just a statistic. And I think this is one of the biggest challenges that farmed animals face is that the suffering is so massive it's easy for us to shut down and just view it as a statistic. And unfortunately these numbers have sort of historically increased because more Americans have said that they're switching from red meat to white meat and that they're somehow doing their health a favor by eating chickens instead of pigs or cows. 
And this has come at great expense to birds, which of course are smaller, so you have to kill more of them to get the same poundage of meat. Now this is a, an actual photograph of a deep fried chicken head that a woman found in her bucket of KFC. Now needless to say, this woman was not very happy with her dining experience. She contacted the local newspaper, and this photograph ran all across the country, and people were very sick, sickened by this. And I think that that reaction shows just how disconnected we've become from our food choices. We can now go into the grocery store, and we can get meat and cellophane packages. We can even get chicken nuggets in the shape of dinosaurs for kids. We never really have to come face to face with these animals. And we live in a society where very few of us will ever have to interact or have the opportunity to interact with farm animals. And we actually really degrade them in our language and how we talk about them. If someone indulges too much, we call them a heifer or a pig. If somebody is, is frightened or fearful, we say that they're a chicken. So just in the way in which we talk about these animals, we really downplay them as individuals. But I think once we stop to actually look at these animals, we see that they are very deserving of our respect and consideration. So I want to talk a little bit about who farmed animals are. This is a photograph of, on the, on the right, a hen, and on the left, a rooster, of the wild ancestors of the modern chicken. Now, these were birds that came from the jungles of Southeast Asia. They lived in an environment very full and rich with color and sound. They lived in groups of about 10 birds, and they would live for up to 12 years. Now, we have genetically manipulated these animals almost beyond recognition in some ways, and I'll talk about that a bit later. But what we see is, even after thousands of years of farming these birds, they still retain those same desires that their ancestors did. This is a photograph of rescued egg-laying hens that spent their entire lives in tiny cages where they couldn't even touch the ground. And within the first few hours or days of being rescued and given the opportunity, they're dust bathing, they're building nests, and they're perching in trees. Now we've all heard the term watchful mother hen, and this is certainly a well-deserved title for these animals. They are incredible parents. In fact, the bond between chick and mother starts before the birds even hatch. They start to chirp back and forth in the final week while they're in their eggs, and the, the mother hen will literally sacrifice her life and her safety to protect her chicks from predators. These animals have a distinct language. We have at least 30 different calls that chickens have that are distinct enough for overhead predators versus ground predators. We know that they have, in, that they have a distinct tone with birds that they consider to be friends or familiar with. We know that chickens can recognize up to 100 other birds based on their distinct facial features. So I know for many of us, if we saw a flock of 100 chickens, we'd think they all looked almost exactly the same. But to chickens, they look as different as each and every one of us in this room look to us. Now, they've done studies that show that chickens understand that recently hidden objects still exist. This isn't rocket science, but this is beyond the ability of young human children. They've done studies that show that chickens can pass information along generationally. They took a group of chickens and they presented them with two types of corn. One was a dark colored corn which was safe and nutritious. The other was a light-colored corn, which they laced with a chemical that made the chickens sick, but didn't kill them. Now, the first group of chickens ate both types of corn, and they became ill after eating light-colored corn. Two, three, four generations later, they found that the chicks and the birds were, were only eating the dark-colored corn and not the light-colored corn because their mothers and their grandparents and on and on and on were teaching them this information that they learned generations earlier. And finally, scientists are, are catching up to this, this reality. Back in 2005, the scientific community called for a complete remapping of the bird brain, saying that 90% of the over 2,000 terms that are used in referring to the structure of the avian brain is outdated. And we now know, as you see in this illustration here, that the vast majority of a bird's brain is responsible for complex cognitive behavior or learning. People, for the longest time, thought birds were just going around and being instinctive with everything that they did. But quite the contrary. They're learning from everything that they're taught from their parents and their environment. So the old, the old view is that um, a very small amount of their brain was used for learning, as you see over on the right-hand side in the pink. 
And then there are pigs, a personal favorite of mine. I think if you've ever had the opportunity to actually look into the eyes of a pig at a sanctuary or unfortunately on the transport truck, it's hard to, to not understand how much thinking is going on behind those, those eyes. Uh, they have at least 20 different oinks that we recognize as being very different. They have long-term memories. There was a study done at Penn State where they took a group of pigs and they presented them with three different objects. One was a dumbbell, one was a frisbee, and one was a, uh, a ball. And they taught the pigs to sit next to the dumbbell, to pick up the frisbee, and to jump over the ball. Now those pigs, they took away from those objects for three years without ever seeing them, brought them back, three years later, presented them with the objects, and 100% of the pigs, all of them, remembered without any re-coaching or teaching what to do when presented with those objects. Now, we also know that, as Donald Broom says, pigs have the cognitive ability to be sophisticated, even more so than dogs, and certainly three-year-olds. He's talking about three-year-old humans. Now, anyone who has children or has nieces or nephews knows just how intelligent and curious and the sense of humor and mischief that three-year-olds can get into. The same is true with pigs. We know that pigs understand cause and effect, and they've shown this by teaching pigs how to play remote-controlled video games, which is what you see here. Now, I have mixed feelings about bringing an entire other species into the video game <laughs> revolution. We're facing all sorts of problems of our own from that one. And then, of course, there are cows, who I think are just some of the most benevolent, peaceful creatures that you could ever lay eyes on. We know that pigs, uh, I'm sorry, we know that cows form very close maternal bonds with their young. There are so many stories of mother cows escaping factory farms and traveling miles on end to be relocated with their baby calves who are at veal farms. We know that cows enjoy solving problems and that they get excited when they've solved problems, that they have best friends that they're very loyal to. And finally, I just want to talk about fish for a bit. And I think even in the animal protection and vegetarian community, we oftentimes ignore fish because they sort of inhabit a world that is very different from us. And they don't have the ability to have the same sort of facial expressions as we do or other mammals do, for example. So it's very difficult for us to understand or relate to their feelings. They can't scream out when they're in pain. But we now know quite a bit about fish. Uh, there are, are many fish that form lifelong monogamous relationships, which I think is more than can be said for most people that I know. <laughs> uh, they, we also know that without a doubt fish feel pain. There was a study that they injected bee venom under the scale of fish, and they found that their heart rate elevated, that they started to release natural painkillers, and they started to run, rub that area of their body up against the side of the tank. And not only do we know that they suffer pain, but we know that they have emotional lives as well. As we see in this, this image, though the structure of a, of a fish's brain may look different from ours, there are still the same active areas. So we see on the surface of the fish's end brain, there are structures that serve functions similar to the limbic system of mammals. And mammals, these Cebriol receptors are responsible, among other things, for the emotional evaluation of information, and they play a role in creating memories and in learning processes. We know that fish release oxytocin, which is a feel-good drug, and in fact, we're waking up to the reality of fish having needs so much that in uh, Germany, they've actually banned sport fishing because it is cruel to animals. Now, I say all this because I think it's important for us to have an understanding of who these animals are, but really I think it's somewhat irrelevant when we talk about our obligation to these animals. I don't think it really matters if they can solve mathematical equations or, or anything that I've just described. In fact, I think that there's an argument that these intelligent tests are really based on our standards. And if we were to go up against tests that these animals created, many of us would fail rather miserably. I think it really boils down to what Jonathan, what Jeremy Bentham said. He said, the question is not can they reason, nor can they talk, but can they suffer? And we know without a doubt that farmed animals, just like all animals, suffer pain and fear and distress. 
So our role, and I think our duty as a so-called civilized and compassionate society is to extend our circle of compassion to include farmed animals. Unfortunately, that's not how they're currently being treated. Now, I want to talk a bit about how those nine billion individuals that we raise and kill for food live and die. Most of them live indoors on huge industrial factory farms, or as the government calls them, concentrated feed feeding animal operations. And they're really treated as little more than machines. And I use that word because the industry has used that, that word. This is a quote from National Hog Farmer magazine. It says, the breeding sow, sow should be thought of and treated as a valuable piece of machinery whose function is to pump out baby pigs like a sausage machine. And now, because people are becoming more sensitive and aware to this issue, the industry is actually publishing in their, their trade journals new words that are less offensive when talking about what they actually do to animals. For example, backup killers at slaughterhouses who slit the birds' throats, they're calling backup extinguishers for the birds. Now, pigs, this is how the vast majority of pregnant sows are kept in this country, in, in stalls two feet wide, they can't even turn around. They literally go crazy, because not only they have no physical stimulation, they have no mental stimulation. So they literally stare in the same spot day after day after day, and as a result, they start to really break down, and they resort to stereotypic behaviors like biting the bars of their cages or banging the heads of their cage of their banging their heads against the sides of the cages. This is a photograph taken by an undercover investigator with Mercy for Animals that shows a baby male piglet that had been castrated without any painkillers, and as a result, it was a botched castration and his insides essentially ruptured and came out of the incision hole. Um, castrations are done by new hires. These are not veterinarians. These are people that are working at an alarming rate. They have really no training. There's no sanitation of the equipment, and this, this is um, a, a rather common problem. And we've really played God with how these animals are treated. We have manipulated their lives from beginning to end and manipulated their bodies in ways that cause acute and chronic pain to these animals. In this image, we see the two types of birds that are used in food production today. On the right is a meat-type bird called a broiler chicken. And on the left is an egg-laying-type hen. You see that the broiler chickens are bred to be very large and grow very fast. The egg-laying hens are bred to be much smaller. Now, in this, this image, you see the, uh, a meat-type bird that was raised in the 1950s. It took them almost 70 days to reach market weight, and market weight then was much lower than it is now. And on the right, we see a modern-day broiler chicken who are killed when they're only 45 to 47 days old. These are literally baby animals going to the slaughterhouse. And as you can see, they're bred to be much larger. So these are baby animals that have excessive amounts of weight, and as a result, they suffer from many of the same problems as childhood obesity. They have joint problems, they have heart and lung problems, and they're really in chronic pain. In fact, over 90% of broiler chickens have problems even walking by the time that they go to slaughter. And they've done studies that also show that the vast majority of these birds will choose feed that has painkillers in it versus uh, non-painkiller feed. Egg-laying chickens, they're kept in tiny battery cages about the size of a file drawer, confining up to seven or eight birds. These animals are given less space than a notebook-sized piece of paper to live their entire lives. They can't spread their wings, they can't walk, perch, roost, dust bathe, really engage in anything that's natural to them. And as a result, they start to suffer from feather loss, and many of them will die in their cages. And Animals that are used for milk production are really treated as little more than milk producing machines. They're artificially inseminated because cows, like all mammals, have to give birth to lactate. So the babies are literally dragged from their side and used for veal if they're males. Now this illustration, I think, puts into perspective the whole issue of milk consumption from other species. I think you'd be hard-pressed to find someone who's driving down a country road and sees a flock of cows and just starts salivating and is so turned on by this that they're going to slam on the brakes, throw open the, the door, and run, under, run under the cow to start suckling. 
But we've become so used to being told that milk is the perfect food, and it's true. Human breast milk is the perfect food for baby humans, and cow's milk is the perfect food for baby cows. But we really are the only species to drink milk past infancy, the only species to drink the milk of another species. We'd find it odd to see in the grocery store Rottweiler milk or giraffe milk or rat milk, but we're just so used to seeing cow's milk. So uh, Ruth Harrison, I think, really summed up the whole situation of how we treat farmed animals in this country well when she said, if one person is unkind to animals, it's considered to be cruelty. But where a lot of people are unkind to animals, especially in the name of commerce, the cruelty is condoned, and once sums of money are at stake, will be defended to the last by otherwise intelligent people. So we have a system where if you can find a dog or a cat in a cage where they can't move for their entire life, you're a criminal. But if you do it to millions of farmed animals, you're a business executive. Because of time, I'm going to spare all of you the emotional trauma of watching uh, Farm to Fridge. But I do encourage you to check it out at meatvideo.com. So when we talk about the cruelty that farmed animals are subjected to, many people feel disgusted, they feel angry, and they say, how could anyone do this to an animal? What is wrong with these people? They must be sadistic. Well, the reality is, is that many people on factory farms and slaughterhouses are simply doing society's dirty work. They're taking jobs that nobody else wants. This is a quote from an anonymous factory farmer that was in Eating Animals by Jonathan Saffron Ford. He said, what I hate is when consumers act as if farmers want these things, when it's consumers who tell farmers what to grow. They want cheap food, we've grown it. Now, in fact, this work is, is so traumatic that they've done studies that find that slaughterhouse workers uh, suffer from what is called perpetration-induced traumatic stress disorder, which is a, which is a form of post-traumatic stress disorder. And this is when individuals are forced to participate day in and day out in behaviors, cruel behaviors against others that they normally wouldn't do or want to be involved with. And as a result, many factory farm slaughterhouse workers self-medicate Drug use, alcohol abuse runs rampant in these facilities, and we've seen it firsthand through our investigations. So I think we have to ask ourselves, if this is a system, if this is an industry that just by working within it, people are emotionally damaged, what does that say about us as people? Are we meant to be involved in this? Are we meant to be supporting it? And I think the answer is no. Unfortunately, the legal system is behind the times in terms of public opinion. And that's because the meat, dairy, and egg industries are so large and so powerful that they've been able to lobby on a state and federal level to exempt farm animals from protections. So this is sort of what our legal system looks like in this country regarding farm animals. On a federal level, there's not a single federal law that provides protection to farm animals during their life on factory farms. Birds, which make up over 95% of that nine billion, are completely exempt from federal protection. They have no protection during transport or at the slaughterhouse. They're exempt from the from the Humane Methods of Slaughterhouse, uh, Humane Methods of Slaughter Act. And as a result, many of these birds have their throats slit while they're fully conscious, and they go into the tanks of scalding hot water that's used to remove the feathers. Now, this is so common that the industry has a term for these birds. They call them redskins because their skin becomes bright red if they're still alive and they enter these scalding tanks. And as I mentioned with the, the story of the piglet, there are at least 30 states that have common farming exemptions, which essentially hand over the power to decide what's acceptable and what's legal to the very industries that profit off of these animals. Now you can imagine what the result is. Corners are cut and animal welfare comes secondary or much further down the line to profits. So what we see is that Acts of abuse that could land you in jail if you inflicted them on just one dog or cat, you're allowed to do with, with impunity to uh, farmed animals. Things such as branding, literally inflicting third degree burns on the skin of animals without painkillers. That's considered legal if you do it to a farmed animal. Castration without painkillers, cutting into animals that are fully conscious and aware, ripping out their testicles, cutting off their tails, these are things 
that are done to thousands of piglets every day in this country. Now you can imagine, if you took your beloved puppy into your local vet and said, it's time for Fido to be neutered, it's the responsible thing to do. And the vet took Fido by his hind legs, and right there with you in the room, took his scalpel and cut into Fido and ripped his testicle out and handed him back to you. You'd probably be very upset, you'd probably contact law enforcement, and that vet would not only be charged with animal abuse, but would be shut down for malpractice. Yet, piglets reach, uh, are subject to this every single day. And also, these common farming exemptions allow for things like de-beaking of chicks, literally cutting through their sensitive beak tissue without any painkillers. This leads to acute and chronic pain. Many of the birds die because they're unable to eat because it's so painful. Now, now, thankfully, we're starting to see, really just in the last five years, movement away from some of the worst factory farm abuses. These have been long and hard-fought battles, many of them by concerned citizens. And I, I think that one of the tipping points in, in what we're seeing as now a larger societal change on farm animal issues came with Proposition 2 in California back in 2008. This was an initiative that was very modest, certainly not perfect, but it started to establish basic legal rights for farmed animals. It said that cows, pigs, chickens need to be given enough space to stand up, turn around, lie down, and extend their limbs. Very basic. But that law out would outlaw barren battery cages, gestation crates, and veal crates. It was the most popular citizen-driven ballot initiative in all of California's history. More people voted for Prop 2 in 2008 than voted for Obama in California. And that really sent a strong message to meat producers nationwide that consumers do not want to tolerate this level of abuse. And we have since seen a number of states follow suit. There's now nine states that have banned gestation crates for breeding pigs, about eight that have banned veal crates, and Michigan has also worked to ban barren battery cages. And I want to talk just quickly about our undercover work at Mercy for Animals and some of the successes that we've had recently. And I think this is further evidence of the change that is brewing. We are finally starting to see law enforcement officials in rural areas, whether it be rural Texas, rural Ohio, rural North Carolina, willing to go after large corporations that abuse animals and break the law. This is something that was unheard of five years ago, ten years ago, you'd be left out of town for even suggesting it. But now we see that the laws are starting to reflect public opinion. There's still a long way to go. But even district attorneys who are very buddy-buddy with the ag industry say, we simply cannot defend this to the public. And here are a few examples. One of our last investigations was at a butterball turkey factory farm in North Carolina. We sent an investigator there undercover, and they documented workers throwing birds, bashing their heads in with metal pipes, kicking them, and also leaving birds to suffer from open wounds and infections, providing them with no veterinary care. Now that investigation in North Carolina, the largest turkey producing state in the entire country, led to law enforcement raiding the factory farm on grounds of animal cruelty. For two days, veterinarians and animal welfare experts individually inspected thousands of birds. They euthanized those that were sick and injured. And finally, a few months later, five butterball workers were charged with felony and misdemeanor counts of animal abuse. Another case that I think really illustrates uh, the progress that's being made is in Hart, Texas. We did an investigation at E6 Cattle Company, and they can find 10,000 calves in tiny wooden crates. And when these animals become sick or injured, many of them are left to suffer or die. If they wanted to, quote unquote, euthanize the animals, workers were given hammers and pickaxes and instructed to bash in the skulls of these baby animals, as you see from this video still here. Now, our investigation led to uh, six felony arrest warrants for workers and the owner of the facility himself uh, being arrested and pleading guilty to animal cruelty charges. This is in the heart of Texas, cattle country. And this investigation had a bit of a happy ending for four baby calves who we were able to rescue, our investigator was able to get out, 
and they're now living at a wonderful sanctuary in California. This is Ari and Bob, uh, just a few hours after getting to the sanctuary. Now these investigations that we do that really pull back the curtains on factory farms and show people what's going on, um, the meat, dairy, and egg industry, they don't really like them very much. <laughs> Because this is what they want people to think a farm looks like. And they spend hundreds of millions of dollars every year creating this facade and this, this idyllic view of what farm life is. So an undercover video after undercover video comes out showing people the truth, their profit margins start to decline, they start to get in legal trouble, and they don't like that very much. So how have they responded? Have they started to clean up their act? Have they started to improve conditions for animals? Well, don't hold your breath. Instead, they've decided to shoot the messenger, to silence the messenger. And they've been doing this with so-called ag-gag bills that have been proposed now in about eight states. And the, the wording varies a bit from bill to bill. The intent is the same. And that's to prevent animal rights activists from documenting animal abuse and exposing that to the public. So, these bills, we feel, are a violation of freedom of speech, freedom of press, that they're unconstitutional, and that they seek to shield animal abusers from public scrutiny. And in fact, they're so egregious that a coalition of 30 national organizations, including the, um, the ACLU, human rights organizations, environmental organizations, animal protection organizations, press organizations, just attorney organizations, have all said, this is a bad idea, it's bad for animals, and it's bad for consumers. Now, this is the, the language uh, here of a Minnesota bill, and this bill is so far-reaching that it would make it a crime to not only take a photograph, but to possess a photograph that was taken at an animal facility without the owner's consent. An animal facility in this law not only includes factory farms, but it includes pet stores, pet groomers, uh, zoos, anyone that has a quote-unquote professional relationship with animals. And that would make it a felony. So you could go to jail for years on end for doing this. So example, for example, if you went to a pet shop and you saw a cute puppy and you wanted to take a picture with your, with your iPhone and text that to your friend, you could now be charged as a felon for doing this. And not surprising, the vast majority of consumers oppose this. And Iowa, the largest egg and pork producing state in the nation, the, the newspaper there, the Des Moines Register, found that the vast majority of voters there, uh, in some cases upwards of 70%, said that they opposed the ag gag legislation. And Mercy for Animals has, has fought very hard against these in a number of states. This is a, a demo that we did outside of the Iowa State House after the bill actually passed the House and the Senate and was waiting on Governor Terry Branston's desk to be signed. Thousands of people called the government, the governor and said, don't sign this bill, it's a bad thing. Well, here's a photograph of Governor Terry Branson from, uh, from Iowa. You might, you might be able to tell he did sign the bill. He wasn't very sympathetic to our message. Um, this is a photograph from just a few weeks ago. We all heard about the big pink slime controversy and now these places are going bankrupt. Well, he called a news conference in Iowa to defend this company. And you can see him here with his loyal uh, animal exploiting friends who literally have, have contributed hundreds of thousands of dollars to his campaign. And there have been exposés now that show what we all would have suspected, that these politicians and agriculture states have been bought and paid for by the agriculture industries. Now, we're, we're not done fighting these. We're going to uh, challenge these bills as unconstitutional and fight them all the way to the Supreme Court if we need to. Now, stopping to think for a minute about the negative impact that these efforts could have, I think we have to think back to when Upton Sinclair wrote The Jungle. And had ag-gag bills been on the books, this expose never would have come out, or Upton Sinclair would have been arrested and charged as a criminal. Now, we know that his brave efforts to expose the unsanitary and dangerous conditions in slaughterhouses led to the, the first basic reforms and oversight of those industries. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the power that we all have to transform. I think many of us can, can feel like 
we're invested in this system or our culture is invested in this system or maybe our friends and family members will just never get this. But I want to say that there is hope for every single person. And that's without exception. This, this is Virgil Butler. And Virgil worked for 10 years at a Tyson slaughterhouse in Arkansas. Virgil's job was to snap chickens leg first into moving shackles when they then went and had their throat slit. And Virgil started to become very upset and traumatized by the abuse that he witnessed. He witnessed workers stomping on birds and ripping their heads off and putting ice bombs inside of chickens, just horrible things. And he became so disturbed that he said, I can't be involved in this system anymore. Even though Virgil lived in that trailer that you see behind him in this, this photograph, he had no money, no resources, but he knew that he just could not be involved in this anymore. So Virgil went vegan, and he started blogging about his experiences. He teamed up with animal rights organizations, and he went around the country and he spoke to activists, he spoke to individuals, he spoke to corporations about what he saw. Now, if Virgil Butler, who literally sent millions of animals off to their death, can make that realization, can make that change, I have complete faith that anyone can do that. And Virgil's not the only one. We hear stories about Howard Lyman and Harold Brown, people who had millions of dollars invested in feedlots who just said one day, I'm not going to do it. I think we have to start looking at our food choices and we have to encourage others to look at their food choices. It's not simply a personal choice or a palate preference, but a decision that we're making that has profound consequences. This is an issue we can't be neutral on. We're either supporting cruelty and abuse and exploitation, or we're making kind and compassionate choices. I think if this was nine billion dogs or cats that were subjected to this abuse, we would be up in arms as a nation. This would be on the front page of every paper, it'd be on CNN every single night until the issue is addressed. We need to have the same sense of urgency knowing that these farmed animals suffer pure fear and pain in the same way. And I think that this really boils down to a matter of being consistent with our ethics and putting our ethics squarely on the table each time we sit down to eat. The economist said few people would keep a hen in a shoebox for her entire egg-laying life, but practically everyone would eat smartly packaged farm fresh eggs from battery hens. So if we wouldn't treat animals in this way on our own, in good conscience, and be comfortable and proud of it, we really shouldn't be paying others to do that for us. And it really is that simple. I think if this is what the egg aisle of the grocery store looked like, if we had to come face to face with the animals, if we had to know their names and their stories, people just wouldn't tolerate it. But it's hidden behind glossy ad campaigns and the cellophane packages, and we don't have to confront it. That's our challenge, is to make sure that people know these animal stories. And by simply changing our diet, by going towards a vegan diet, we can literally spare over 3,000 animals during our lifetime, on average. And this is what that number of animals looks like. So it's not just a matter of making a personal change, but it's a change that will literally affect thousands of animals. And this is all about prevention. Now thankfully, this is where things get a little bit more exciting. <laughs> thankfully we're starting to see change on this issue. The National Farm Bureau, who is probably number one enemy to farmed animals in this country, did a study that found that 51% of Americans are now familiar with the Meatless Monday campaign. And of those, they found that 18% of Americans are observing Meatless Mondays. And that is in large part because it is a campaign that is being endorsed far and wide by universities, by scientists, by celebrities. Oprah has endorsed this. Their cafeterias at Harpo are now observing Meatless Mondays. We have some of the best-selling books in this country that are all about vegan health and nutrition. You just heard from Kathy Freston. She is one of the many people that are helping to push this issue into the mainstream, from the margins to the mainstream. Uh, Bloomberg Business Week did an article called The Rise of the Power <coughs> Vegan, and they spotlighted billionaires that are vegans 
and we see Biz Stone, one of the co-founders of Twitter, who is an outspoken vegan activist going on Martha Stewart to talk about veganism and why he's vegan for ethical choices. We have hip-hop mogul Russell Simmons, who is an outspoken vegan activist. Former President Bill Clinton, who is eating a plant-based diet. And then Steve Wynn, billionaire from Las Vegas who owns the Wynn Resorts, is now also an ethical vegan. He actually bought 10,000 DVDs of the film Eating and gave to every single Wynn employee because not only did he want them to see the power and consequences of their food choices, he also wanted to lower his health insurance rates because he wanted to be healthy. And we see now that mainstream media are covering the issue of veganism as a healthy lifestyle, that this is something that is here to stay. Vogue magazine, New York Times, Glamour, NPR, Vanity Fair, all in the last year have had major profile pieces on this issue. And that's translating over to a booming business for, for meat alternatives. We now have national restaurant chains that are expanding at an incredible rate, such as Veggie Grill and Native Foods. We have meatless meals now that are being served from coast to coast. This is a market that has expanded every year, almost doubling in the last five or 10 years. And this is an article from Nation, Nation's Restaurant News. This was a front cover article talking about the growth in this. And this is a photograph of a 100% vegan dining cafeteria at a college in Denton, Texas. Wow. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and to, to top that off, uh, they're at the, the greatest place on earth, as they say, uh, Disney World in, in, uh, in Florida, uh, an old McDonald's restaurant that had, they removed all the McDonald's from, from Disney World, has been replaced by Baby Cake's vegan cupcakes and desserts. So now we're literally having McDonald's that are being replaced by vegan companies at these huge mainstream family establishments. And then we look at the bottom line numbers. We see that meat consumption in the last six years has decreased over 10%. Egg production has steadily decreased. And that all adds up to 400 million fewer farmed animals being raised and killed for food in this country. We're finally reaching that tipping point. There was a study done that of college campuses and students that found that the number of vegetarians has increased in the last five years by 50%. The number of vegans on college campuses has doubled in the last five years. The Washington Post did a, a poll less than a year ago that said, what will future generations condemn us for? And this really is a generational issue, as many social justice movements are. And they found that our treatment of animals and food production was second only to our abuse of the environment. 22% of people saying that's what future generations would condemn us for the most. And I believe that the animal protection movement is really the most pressing social justice movement of our time. If we look at the number of individuals that are suffering, and we look at the intensity of their suffering. And this is a movement that is unique from almost every other social justice movement because those that are being exploited those that are being misused, they cannot speak up on their own behalf. They cannot lobby Congress. They can't form major boycotts. They can't say, please, stop doing this to me. I deserve consideration. They need us to do that on their behalf. Now, if you are at a slaughterhouse or a factory farm, if you've seen videos of factory farms or slaughterhouses, you know that these animals do have a voice and that they do scream and they kick and they fight and they struggle and they try the best that they can to protest against the suffering that's being inflicted upon them. But they can't translate that into our culture and our society and advocating for change. So I'll leave you with this quote from Harriet Beecher Stowe. She said, it's a matter of taking the side of the weak against the strong, something the best people have always done. And I think it's difficult to think of a group that is weaker and more vulnerable than farmed animals. And certainly, if we as a society can extend our circle of compassion to include farmed animals, who many of us have a hard time relating to, 
Think of how much better our society would be for all of us. We are in a position where we hold all of the power. And what we do with that power is a matter of life and death for these animals. We can choose to be great stewards and compassionate and kind to these animals, or we can choose to subject them to the misery that we've heard about this afternoon. So I urge you to join me in taking the side of the weak on this issue and giving these animals a powerful voice. Thank you very much. We'll take questions, just to let everyone know, I, as always, went way over time. Um, but if you do have questions, I'm happy to answer them, but I will not be offended if you need to leave. So yes, we had a question in the back. Hi, yeah. how are you? I wanted to thank you very much for this talk. Um, and I guess my question is, um, you know, you talk about the real symptom of all of this is the fact that Americans need way By any human that's ever been alive on the planet, right. you know, and, and just compared to even people living in you know our country, in other parts of the world, you know, Americans eat three, four times more meat than they do, and so that the supply has to just keep up with the demand, and that's what's causing a lot of this. So, with that in mind, um, what are groups like uh, you know your organization doing to tackle this from that issue? Uh, you know, connecting with you know, kind of riding on this whole green movement and everyone. You know, I guess, yeah, I mean, I guess have you, what, what are you doing to kind of tackle from that perspective and then using media um, to kind of positively spin that um, change into action? That was a lot of questions spun into one. <laughs> <laughs> Let me give you a bunch of answers spun into one. Um, so we're addressing it on a, a lot of fronts. One is with the Meatless Monday campaign. We're very involved in that. You know, we want, we want people to know that, yes, reducing your meat consumption, this isn't a black and white issue where you're either hardcore vegan or you're eating meat every single meal, that you can start to move in that direction. And if we can decrease the, the meat consumption, we can decrease the number of animals being killed, and hopefully those animals can have lives that are filled with less suffering. We um, do a lot of work with environmental organizations, teaming up with them to, sh to talk about the environmental impacts of animal agriculture. Uh, health organizations talk about the health impacts of, of these issues. In terms of working with media, we do a lot of online advertisements pointing people to our, meat, our farm to fridge video at meatvideo.com. Uh, human education talks at, at schools and colleges. We have uh, commercials that are running on MTV stations nationwide, reaching younger people. So we really do believe that we need uh, a whole host of tactics to address this issue. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm also from Ohio, so first of all, thank you very much. It's, part of uh, these days, it's kind of hard sometimes to find positive things about the state of Ohio. <laughs> That's um, why I left. <laughs> I'm, in, I'm in Western Mass now. That, that said, I work in the labor movement, and we're being overrun by Citizens United um, Supreme Court ruling with unlimited campaign finance money into, into campaigns. Um, but at least we have a natural constituency. We have, a, say, 80 people in the, in the House that are progressive caucus. It seems that in this struggle, you don't always have a natural constituency. And I'd like to know, is that right and how it relates to this, this whistleblower gag rule that you were talking about where you're silencing people right. from exposing stuff. Yeah. Well, like I said, when I, I said this, this, uh, this movement is very different from others because you don't have that, um, you don't have that segment of the population that can really raise a ruckus. Now, my gosh, if farm animals had weight, there would be nine billion of them and we'd be able to get a whole lot of things accomplished. Um, but yes, it is a challenge because especially in these rural areas, agriculture is king. And Republican, Democrat, whatever it is, they're run by and answer to large agriculture. And that's exactly what we saw in Iowa. So it, it is a challenge. Now, on the optimistic side of that, caring about animals, as, as I said, that 96% number, is an issue that transcends all parties and lines as well. So it's a matter of us becoming more mobilized, more unified, more political savvy, and uh, 
you know, even then, in places where agriculture is number one, it's always going to be a challenge. But at the federal level, we may be able to get some, some action. So, yes, it's challenging. It's, it's, I think, the same as the environmental movement in, in some regards.